now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his, bro his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went to, into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Pray with me as we think on the message tonight called of God. Our Father and our God speak to us in clear tones. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross that your young people and your people in general may receive a word in due season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You would have to be a hermit to not know what's going on in our days. You would have to be a recluse to not know the various aspects going on in the political and social realm of our days. You, you are living right in the hub. You, you, you are right in the hub of the madness going on today. Uh, you get up to the news. You go to sleep to the news. You are on Facebook, Twitter, you are tweeting, you are Instagramming, you are seeing all kinds of things and every day we can anticipate a tweet from the highest office in the world. Not knowing what it will be. Some of us know tweets more than we know scripture. Some of us know what's going on in the White House more than we know what's going on on the throne of God. Some of us are more in tune with what is going on around us than what is going on within us. And so we turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 so we can be reminded that when God calls you, He does not call you to be conformed to your surroundings, but He calls you to be transformed by His Word. The Bible says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene. Uh, Luke, I know when you read your Bible, you've read your Bible in the past, you have bypassed this text. Uh, you tried to say the names, and because you had trouble saying the names, you just skimmed it over. Because you said, this really does not mean anything to me. But I want to show you today that it could mean everything to you. What Luke is reminding us and what Luke, through the Holy Spirit, has written this down was to show us who was reigning in the political realm during the time when John the Baptist would be called by God. He says, Herod is the the head in Judea, he says, uh, Pontius Pilate is the head, so you have the Roman leader, Pontius Pilate, you have the Israelite leader in Herod, you have his brother reigning, so uh, you have these leaders in the political realm. You know, some people strive for greatness. Some of you sitting here, you still may have a desire to be great. You young man, you may have a desire to accomplish something great that people would know your name. 
Or maybe you want to make money in life. Maybe by the time you're 30, you look like you're about 19. Probably by the time you're 30, you want to be a millionaire. You want to buy your mother a house. You, you, you want to live in the upper echelon of the upper Marlboro section. Or maybe stay here in White Marsh. Who knows? Everyone sitting here has dreams. Dreams of living a prosperous life. Dreams of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And sometimes you can get so caught up that you think that that is God's will for you. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that God's will for you is antithetical to America's dream. God's dream for you is not the American dream. God's dream for you is something greater than the American dream, something more substantive than the American dream. America promises you a job, maybe. A house, maybe. Happiness, can't guarantee, but we'll let you pursue it. God has something bigger for you. He says, while great people were leaders, we have the leaders in the political realm. Then he says Caiaphas and Ananias were the high priests during that time. So we have the political leaders, we have the religious leaders. Are you with me? You can talk back. You're not more holy, staying silent. Amen. 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 We're not Catholic here. Come on, say amen. You can talk back to me. It's all right. It won't hurt you and I won't bite. We have the political leaders, the great people, the people that society is looking up to. Pontius Pilate, Herod, Philip, Licinius. The talk in the homes is we want our, our sons, we want our daughters to uh, attain to these positions in life, maybe. Maybe if we send our son to, to the Jerusalem seminary, he will one day become the high priest. Maybe one day if our son networks or our daughter networks with the right people, uh, they can get an inroads in the political realm. And the Bible says while these were the rulers that the word of God came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. You missed it. The Bible says that, that when the word of God looked for somebody, when God sought for somebody, when God decided that he needed somebody to be a mouthpiece, to speak his word. He looked at the political realm and he couldn't find anyone there. He looked at uh, uh, Pontius Pilate. He looked at Herod. He looked at Philip. He looked at Licinius and the word of God did not come to them. Then he looked at the religious realm. He looked at the high priest. He looked at the leaders that should know the scriptures. He looked at the people who should know the times. He looked at the people who were delving and using the word of God strictly to control the people. Not free the people, but control the people. To tell them how to dress, where to go, what to eat who God is, what God wants of them. But when the word of God looked for somebody, it looked at those religious leaders and God said, uh-uh, can't use them. They're too corrupt. They're too set in their ways. They don't know me. They don't seek me. They seek their own interests. And so the Bible says, the word of God moved and it got to Pontius Pilate, said nope. Got to Herod, said nope. 
got to Philip, said, definitely not. He's sleeping with his brother's wife. Said he went to Las Cities, said, uh-uh. Went to Caiaphas and Ananias, said, they're too corrupt. They look holy. They wear the robes. They speak the jargon. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> but the word of God says I cannot stop there because they will not allow my word to transform them because they have been too conformed to their surroundings. So the Bible says, young people, the word of God came to John the Baptist, not at the seminary. The word of God came to John the Baptist, not in church. The word of God came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. In the wilderness. That, 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 that means the wilderness in the Bible is a place of testing. That means John had positioned himself to, to as a young man be tested. And, and when he allowed God to test him, he came out tried and true. And the word of God came to him. He said, what are you saying, Dr. Sylvester? What are you saying? I'm telling you that you do not need to be conformed to what your surroundings dictate that you should be. But you need to be in tune with God because he doesn't want you to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that's not a simple thing. It's not an easy thing. You see, we look at pedigree. He is the son of Pastor So-and-so. He is the son of the union president. She, she, is, she is the daughter of the, the great evangelist of the conference. She is the daughter of the conference president. And somehow we operate in the church as though pedigree gives you status with God. Pedigree gives you nothing with God. God does not look at who your mama and your daddy is. Or who your mama and daddy are. God does not look at what what house you live in what part of the neighborhood you live in. god doesn't look at that my bible tells me he went down to the ghetto to find a young girl named mary he didn't go to the suburbs he didn't go to the upper class he went to a young girl living in the hood so that when an angel showed up she wondered who was this that showed up in her house. That's who God looks for. He looks for people who are available. He looks for people who may be living in mess, but living a miracle. That's who God looks for. He looks for people who, though they are surrounded by gangbangers and drug dealers, their righteousness is proportionate to the evil around them. That's who God looks for. God doesn't look for, watch it now, what school you went to. God doesn't look for your educational status. What grades you got in school. That's not what God looks for. God looks for who is available to him. Who is willing to submit their will to his will so the bible says no while the word of god was looking it said those political leaders would not do those religious leaders would not do i'm going to find somebody named john the baptist now i've got to also tell you it didn't say the bible came to john the baptist it didn't say the scripture came to john the baptist it said the word of god came to John the Baptist and you're looking at me strange and you're saying pastor the Bible is the word of God and scripture is the word of God no 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 you see let me explain something to you uh, the word of God is bigger than the Bible mm. 
you're going to get in trouble, preacher. No, no, no. The Word of God is bigger than Scripture. You see, before there was Scripture, who was the first person to write Scripture? Moses. So what did they have before that? Very right. Who wrote the Scripture? The first Scripture? Moses. What did they have before that? The Word! The Word! They didn't have a writing? What did Abraham hear when he says, Take thy son, thine only son, and offer him up on a mountain? What scripture did he read? He had his Word. He heard the Word of God spoke to him and he knew the voice my Bible tells me that you will hear his voice saying this is the word walk ye in it the word the word of God symbolizes what God has to say for you at a specific time in a specific place for a particular reason it will not contradict the scriptures scriptures came after the word and the Bible came after scriptures. You're not hearing me. <laughs> Scripture, the Bible, is the compilation of the scriptures. And the scriptures are the writing of the word of God. And so the Bible says John could not allow himself to be corrupted and tainted by the religious leaders who taught at the seminary only how to control the people but God when God has wants to use you church when God wants to, to, to give you a message he has to separate you he has to sanctify you that's why God, you see, this church, uh, forgive me, but it's losing its way. We, we know more of the social voice than we do the salvific voice. We know of the, more of the political voice than we know of the prophetic voice. We, we now define uh, things in our church as liberal or conservative. We define things in our church as progressive or traditional. You know what that is? Those are political terms. Those are worldly terms. You don't read those terms in the Word of God. You read holy and unholy. You read righteous and unrighteous. And to get back to basics, God wants to call young people who have not been tainted by the corruption in the church out of the church. I know a young man who wasn't supposed to be born. His mother had four children and the doctor told her if she got pregnant again, she would not make it. She already had a couple of miscarriages. And the doctor said if you get pregnant again, it may take your life. The pregnancy may take your life. But uh, it was a West Indian family. And some West Indian men don't understand no. And so he, he impregnated his wife again. And she became pregnant, and she prayed all through the pregnancy. God, keep this one. God, and let it be a boy. She had three girls already. And she said, let it be a boy. And sure enough, after nine months, that baby came out, and it was a little boy. And she held that baby on her chest and prayed over it in the hospital and said, Lord, make something of this boy. Well, as life would have it, that couple broke up. And so that little boy and his siblings grew up in a single parent family, migrated from the West Indies, from Trinidad out back over to New York. 
grew up in New York, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Went to public school his whole life. Did not go to church school. But every day his mother would get up and have family worship before she went to work and before she went to school. Every evening when she got home, their chores and had to be done and she would have family worship with them. At 16 years old, he went to live with his father and it didn't work out. So at 16 years old, he began to live on his own. And from the time he was 16 to the present day, he has lived on his own. He got the rights of an emancipated minor. And when he was 17 years old, laying in bed before he graduated high school, he prayed a simple prayer. He said, Lord, make something of my life. A simple prayer. Throughout life, he just started going, working, doing different things, but he heard and felt the call of God in his life. And he stepped away from working on Wall Street to answer the call of God, went down to Oakwood University, old college, got a degree, and then started preaching while he became a teacher. They, he, the conference didn't even hire him. But he started preaching anyway. After a few years, the conference asked him if he would come and pastor the church, and he accepted it, and he started pastoring. He's been pastoring ever since. He's not the son of a prophet. He had no pedigree. He had no name. He had nothing by which he could go and negotiate anything to work in the church. All he did was follow the word of God. From a single parent family, God allowed him to go to Egypt, South Africa, Thailand, Philippines. God allowed him to go to almost every continent except Antarctica. Preaching the word of God because he accepted being separated to be used by God. You cannot seek to do the same things everyone is doing. I know the young man because I look at him every day in the mirror. Every day I'm reminded what God can do. Every day I'm reminded and I came here to tell you there is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others He'll do for you too. You say, boy, there's nothing special about me. I'm the only one in my family never divorced. Wow! Blessed! Put God first! Blessed! Everybody won't like you. He didn't call you for everybody to like you. He says, I called you to give a message. I called you because I have a mission for you. And if I have a mission for you, I'm going to give you a message with the mission. With the mission. And if I give you a message with the mission, you can be guaranteed that the master will always be with you. That's what he's called us to, right, Marsh? That, that's what he's called you to, young people. He's called you to not fit in to this world but fit in to his kingdom. He's called you not to seek for people to give you the glory and uh, uh, to tell you the things that you could be down on this earth, but to know that you are walking and living in the will of God. And if you don't know that, Listen, if you don't know what that is, if you're blinded by the politics in the church, if, if coming to church blinds you from God, it's okay. There's still some people that you can hobnob with that is walking with God. You never have to be alone. So this week, we want to look at the mission God has for us. This week, we want to look at the message God has for us. This week, we want to look at the master that will always be with us. Stand with me, White Marsh.